Hi, I'm Father Nicholas Napolitano, and um, we are presenting now the Lenten, the Lenten mission um, for St. John the Baptist Parish here in Magnolia Springs and for Our Lady of Bon Secours Parish in Bon Secours. Um, it's going to be a journey moving through the deafness of the ears of faith all the way through to the, um, the marks of the true Christian. We'll begin in Mark's Gospel. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they, be they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. As in a lot of scripture, especially in Mark's gospel, there's always two ways that we read and, and hear what the Lord is, is saying and, and, and what he is doing. And especially in Mark's gospel, we have not just kind of the face value facts or events of the day, but we also have the deeper message and, and the symbolic meaning that applies to us in our lives here and now. And it's packed with a lot of different imagery. But to start, it's always a good question to ask when we're reading Mark, well, where is Jesus? When this story happens, what's the context? Where is he? Where is he going? What is he doing? Who is he with? And here he's in the Decapolis, which is... Uh, Latin for, for the ten cities, or Greek for the ten cities. And he's out, out of his way. He's away from um, where Main Street Judaism is, and he's out in these ten cities that, are, that have received a lot of Hellenistic um, influence. And so there's this, this syncretism that happens. It's a, a syncretism that's a blend of Jewish faith, Jewish beliefs, Jewish practices, together with what the Greeks believed what the Greeks believed um, in their pagan religions and what they believed in their own Hellenistic or Greek culture. And so there's this real kind of mixture, this combination of what it means to be a good Jew and what it means to be a good Greek. And it's, it's really not a surprise that it's in that context that Jesus himself experiences and encounters a man who is both deaf and mute. You know, throughout the scriptures, there, there's this constant motif, this constant imagery, this constant knowledge that God speaks to his people. Right? If we, if we read the scriptures and we, we understand what they're saying, even just on face value, the God of scripture, the God of the Bible, he is constantly speaking to the people that he loves, to the people he has made, that he's chosen, that he has called. And so, it's not, it should be expected that we hear him speak, even today. Right? It's, it's to be expected that when Jesus encounters a person, that person hears what it is that he has to say. And so when we get to this man, this man who is deaf and mute, living in the Decapolis, we should not just take it on the face value that he physically cannot hear with his ears or speak with his tongue, but that he has grown deaf to the word of God, right? That he cannot hear Jesus speaking and proclaiming the good news. That his focus, his attention, his knowledge his way of understanding the world, has become so clouded with the world itself that he no longer hears what God himself has to offer. Throughout the scriptures again, 
it, God speaks. In Genesis, God says something. He says, let it be, and all things are created. In the great Shema, in the great prayer of Israel, it begins with, hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. When the young Samuel uh, is struggling in prayer and not knowing, he hears the Lord without recognizing his voice. And Samuel says, speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. And that should be our great practice. That should be kind of where we put our minds and in our hearts. Speak, O Lord. Help me to hear you. Help me to understand what it is that you have for me to hear and to know. And so when Jesus encounters this deaf man in the Decapolis, it's not so much that he's physically deaf. I mean, yes, it's true, right? This man actually cannot hear with his bodily ears. But the more important reality is that he cannot hear the word of God, right? He, he cannot hear the message that has been proclaimed by the prophets. He cannot hear what God is doing throughout Judaism and within this man's own life. He is deaf to God. Time and again throughout the Old Testament, the prophets call Israel to one thing, to listen and to be attentive to hear God's voice. Come back and listen again to what the Lord is saying, to what the Lord is doing. So, what do we do with this? We have this man who can't hear Jesus. But we are this man, right? This isn't so much about the physical miracle of healing the man's ears as it is about the call to allow ourselves to be healed by God. That we have become spiritually deaf to him. So just like this deaf man, well, why can he not hear God? Well, first I would say he can't hear him because of the crowd that surrounds him, right? He's in this context of this crowd that's moving around and following Jesus. You can't hear Jesus. No one in that crowd could hear Jesus because of the, the humdrum, the, the noise, the words, the yelling, the screaming, the, the laughter, the crying, all the noise of the crowd. He can't hear him. He can't hear the Lord because of his proximity. Right? He's nowhere near Jerusalem. He's over in the Decapolis. Right? He, he's, he's physically away from where God is present in the world of Judaism. And it's there, it's in this crowd, it's moved away, but it's also in this Hellenistic context that this man exists. And so he, his mind is filled with all sorts of different words, of different messages, of different noise, of the philosophies of the world, of what the world has to offer, of what the world says is good and, and, and wholesome, of what the world says bring ha brings happiness. And he's so inundated by the Hellenistic philosophy that it, it it fogs out what it is that God is saying. Us too. How many of us right now are, are by proximity distant from the Lord? Some of us were distant just because of the realities of the pandemic. That we, we don't go to church because of this virus that exists right now. Some of us are distant from the Lord because... We just, there's not enough motivation to get us up to, to, to go and pursue him. Some of us are distant from him because of a wound, because someone hurt us by something they said, or they misrepresented the goodness of God. Whatever it is, some of us are just distant because we're busy, or because there's other things in our lives that we've allowed to take precedence over God. But we're distant. We're like this deaf man, we're, we're over there in the Decapolis. We're not here and in the temple. We can't hear him because we're far away from him. Or we can't hear him because we're still sitting in that crowd. Right? We're still sitting with all these voices that are competing for our attention. Whether it is from just watching too much TV or Netflix, whether it is from just staring at our phones all day and all night, whether it's from watching movies or being distracted on the computer or following too much and investing too much in politicians who could really never save the world or investing too much in what this last great celebrity had to say before they were taken off the airwaves or just the, the, the people around us who are clowns and fools kind of creating just entertainment and noise and distraction. Whatever it is, 
There's a crowd. And that crowd has competing voices. And perhaps the crowd is saying competing things. But they're all competing for our attention. Perhaps we don't hear him because we've become tone deaf. Perhaps we don't hear him because we do hear God's voice. But we don't hear the words that he speaks. Perhaps we've become so tone deaf that we mistake spiritualism for faith. Right? You have all sorts of other competing things that, that, that pose to be God's voice. Right? You have the New Age movement. You have crystals in this place or, or this practice over here or this practice of spirituality or of burning sage. But none of that is of God. It's, it's a spiritualist movement. And it, and it sounds like the right music is playing, but we've, lear- we've lost the ability to discern what the words being spoken are. To listen more carefully to the melody that, that captures our attentions. So here's the good news. That the Lord Jesus heals this man. And you have to look intently at what the Lord does. They bring the deaf man to Jesus. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. They begged him to heal him by simply touching him. But the Lord doesn't exactly and directly respond to the request. He takes the man and he removes him from the crowd. He backs him away. Right? Our, our own patron here, John the Baptist, even says it, that, that he is the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, in the desert, in the place where there is no noise. Behold the Lamb of God. So the Lamb of God here with the deaf man takes the deaf man away from the crowd. He takes him to himself where the noise and the distraction, the competing views and the competing words, they they fall away because the proximity is moving from the Decapolis, from out there to in here. From out in the Hellenistic culture to here in an encounter at the living temple that is Jesus himself. We, in this Lenten time, are invited into that same withdrawal, in that same retreat from the noise. Come stand away from the crowd. Come and be quiet and alone with the Lord God, that you may hear His voice. Right? The, the intimacy of this image, of this scene, where it says that Jesus took Him in private, there is no one else around. It's just, it's just the deaf man and the Lord. And in private, this intimacy even deepens. I mean, think about it. This is an absurd scene. If someone takes you by the head and sticks their fingers in your ears and spits on the ground, it's absurd and it's intimate and it's weird. But this is what the Lord does. It's this proximity again. That, and it's the same invitation that we're invited into. Not only to step away from the noise and the crowd and the world, but as we step away, we step close to the Lord Jesus himself. And we allow him that access, that intimacy to us. As he places his fingers in our ears, as he spits on the ground, as he looks up to heaven... And he says, Ephatha. How beautiful of an image is that? That the second person of the Trinity looks up to heaven to establish that connection to the Father with that connection, reaches out to touch that man, almost completing like a divine electricity, a divine circuit, and, and inserts into the man's life, inserts into the man's life the the divine spark itself, the same divine spark that creates us is the same one that redeems us and that gives us new life yet again. 
And he says, be opened. Be opened. And his ears immediately fall open. And he can hear God's voice yet again. Not only that, but his tongue is released and he's able to speak openly. I think a lot of us, and there's a lot of us that sit in these pews, and we're afraid to invite other people into the church. We're afraid to invite other people to encounter the Lord. And we're afraid to because we don't know what to say. Where do I start? How do I tell someone about this immense love of God? How do I call someone into the goodness that awaits them in the sacraments? How do I invite them to this most sacred altar? How could I ever tell them that what they're doing doesn't breathe life in their lives, but but breathes chaos? How could I ever speak that way? You can't. Until the Lord touches us to tell us, be opened. If I haven't been able to hear, right? It's, a, it's, it, it's kind of the side effect of being deaf from birth. You can't speak because you've never heard the, the, the sounds that you need to replicate to speak. And the same is true in spiritual deafness. If I'm not accustomed, if I'm not used to hearing God speak, how can I ever regurgitate? How could I ever repeat? How could I ever speak again the goodness of the Lord if I've never seen his goodness? But we have to allow him into our lives. We have to allow him to touch us, to remove us from the crowd that we're in, to move us into this intimate place with him. Perhaps even through the confessional. Perhaps through the sacrament of penance. That he opens us again. He takes away the myrrh, uh, the, the mire of dirt, of sin that covers our eyes. He takes away the, the, the contagion that causes us not to be able to hear the spiritual truth. He takes away all that makes us ill and deaf. And in doing so, we hear him. And if we spend these days of Lent with that intimacy of hearing him, we would naturally go forward out of this church, out of our churches, out of our pews, and out of those front doors. And we would naturally be filled with so much joy and goodness of the Lord that we become attractive and people flock to us. So that when we do need to speak to evangelize and to call, it's natural. Because we've lost our own spiritual deafness. Allow the Lord to speak that he may make you whole. Let us pray. Lord, teach us to recognize you in the chaos of this world. Help us to identify the crowds that we have surrounded ourselves with that prevent us from hearing your holy word. Help us to recognize your presence in our world and to seek to be near to you. Give us the courage to come to you in the sacraments. Give us the boldness to seek out your forgiveness and confession. Give us the understanding to, to know your word, even as is, it is confused in the midst of this world. Help us to see you as you truly are. Amen.